Gesalek leaned back in his favorite chair and felt something pop before sitting back up. He liked this spot in the bar. He could see all the various races come and go. Some would even ask for his advice. He was an old spacer, and his knowledge of this sector was vast. It was said he had visited almost every system and most inhabited planets in his 170 galactic years, and some of the young would ask for stories of his adventures. But he was tired of traveling and had settled down on this station orbiting the planet Miasma. So he was only slightly surprised when a tall reptilian-like alien approached him. The being looked familiar, but he couldn't quite place which race it was. At least 2.5 meters tall, four muscular arms, bipedal, and a torso covered in tough leather-like plates. Its head was triangular, with a blunt face containing six eyes, a pair of nostrils, and a wide mouth with dozens of small but sharp-looking teeth. It also had eight pronounced fangs, four on top and four on the bottom. It wore only boots, a type of pants, and a utility harness on its torso. You are Gesalek of the Tharo, the alien put it bluntly. Gesalek stared up at the tall being before replying, I am, and who do I have the pleasure of speaking with? I am Buhazum of the Kudrix, he answered. Ah, yes, the Kudrix. He remembered now, his mind searching for what he knew about them. No wonder he didn't recognize them. They were rarely seen outside their body armor and enclosed helmets. They were a warlike race from out near the rim. They had only appeared in this sector twenty years ago by raiding the outer worlds. Five years after that, they carved themselves a foothold in the sector at the expense of the Fatiri. Without asking, the Kudrik sat down next to Gesalek. I understand you know many things about this sector, Buhazum stated. Blunt and straight to the point, Gesalek thought to himself before answering, Yes, I am well traveled. Good, you will come with me, Buhazum added. Taken aback, Gesalek replied, Why in the hell would I do that? To meet my superiors, you will be well compensated, Buhazum said. Getting paid does change things, Gesalek thought to himself. And how far would I have to go? he asked. Buazum promptly replied, Compartment 10, Level 1. So they are at the station and in one of the first-class quarters. Interesting, Gesalek thought before replying, Lead on! It took about ten minutes to reach the compartment, and when the door opened he was slightly surprised to see just how many Kudriks were in there. There were maybe eleven of them, but after studying the Kudriks for a moment, he concluded six were guards. Unlike Buhazum, they wore a variety of raiments that concealed their bodies. It suddenly occurred to Gesalek that since they are rarely seen without their helmets and body armor, they were essentially in disguise and able to move about freely with no one the wiser. He started to wonder just how many Kudriks were hiding in plain sight across the sector. Buhazum stepped forward and bowed. This is Gesalek of Tharo as ordered, your majesty. Buhazum stepped aside so the others could see Gesalek. Finding out he was meeting royalty caught him off guard, but he managed to recover. He gave a bow and spoke, Your Majesty, and then added, I apologize, but I do not know who is who. A richly dressed Kudrek stepped forward. I am Inubasa, Vestas to Empress Shiptu, second wife of Emperor Anunnaki IV, he said while using a sweeping gesture to the Empress. Gesalek turned and bowed to the Empress. My apologies, Your Majesty, for not knowing who you were. The Empress just gave a regal nod of her head. To be honest, Gesalek couldn't tell the difference between male and female Kudreks, or were they all female, he wondered. Another Kudrek stepped forward. Grand Straktigo and Shag Kushana. The Grand Straktigo stepped forward and pushed a button on the console. A map of the sector appeared, and the political boundaries were marked on it. We are embarking on a new campaign, and we need information about races that might be involved, their military capabilities, who their allies are, and which are their most important worlds, he said. Gasalik was shocked at the question, and without thinking, uttered, I can't do that. Help you kill an untold number of sentients? Empress Shiptu nodded to Inubasa, who then stepped forward. The Empress understands your reluctance and offers a compensation of two million galactic credits. Gesalek almost fell over from shock. He could almost buy his own station with that much. Not a big one, but still. After wrestling with his conscience, he agreed to the proposal. The Empress nodded in satisfaction. 
Grand Strak Digo and Shag Kushana pointed to an area on the map. We plan to attack these Hamans and absorb their territory into our empire. We've heard rumors they do not maintain a large fleet and that they're afraid of war. That they'll negotiate a way out of it. Kesalek stared at them in horror. You mean to attack the humans? Taking care to pronounce it correctly for them. Yes, in two standard months, the Grand Stractigo informed him. After Gesalek regained his composure, he said, No one in their right mind attacks the humans. Grand Stractigo and Shagkushana laughed. Why is that? They barely have a dozen systems. We have thousands. What kind of threat could a race afraid to fight be to us? Ask the Takarzians, Gesalek muttered to himself, not intending for the Kudriks to hear. But their hearing was better than he knew. Who are these Takarzians? How can we contact them? By summoning their ghosts, Gesalek thought to himself. You can't. They are extinct in this sector, and there are only rumors of small drifter fleets of survivors never staying in one place too long. And these humans are responsible? So they beat some minor power, probably only a few planets, and we're supposed to be afraid of them. Grand Stractigo and Shag Kushana scoffed. Gesalek replied, Over eighty galactic years ago, the Takarzians once controlled most of this sector, using his finger to indicate where it was. One hundred thirty-eight systems, six hundred habitable planets and moons. Hundreds more with vast resources to be harvested, including the dead rock we currently orbit. Gesalek finished. For a moment, Gesalek thought he saw doubt on some of their faces, but not being familiar with them, he wasn't sure. Grand Stractigo and Shag Kushana was not one of them. We are the Kudriks and fear no one, especially a race afraid of war, even if they won one decades ago. Go on with your explanation as to why we shouldn't attack them, the Empress said. All of the Kudriks seemed shocked that she spoke. Your Majesty, this alien is not worthy to hear you speak. Inubasa exclaimed. Grand Straktigo and Shag Kushana also spoke out. Your Majesty, forgive me, but as Second Empress you are only here in a ceremonial role. With a glare, the Empress addressed them both. That is usually so, but I feel this is important enough for the Emperor to hear all of it and not just selected tidbits. She addressed the Straktigo directly. Would you like me to contact my husband, the Emperor, and see how he responds to my breaking ceremony? Especially after I tell him how you are ignoring the Theron's warning? I like this one, Gesalek thought to himself. Both of the Kudreks acquiesced to the Empress. Looking back towards Gesalek, please continue, she ordered. Yes, Your Majesty, Gesalek bowed and replied. The humans are not afraid of war because of what an enemy may do. Humans are afraid of what it can make them become, Gesalek started. I had a human friend long ago who once explained it to me. Like you, the Takarzians saw them as easy pickings, Gesalek explained. The humans were new to the galactic community and had just started to expand out of their home system. When the Takarzians found out just how much time had passed between the humans' first steps into space and how it took almost two centuries to leave their home system, they assumed they weren't very smart either. I found out from my friend later that it took them so long to leave their cradle because they had been warring amongst themselves almost the entire time, Gesalek stressed. The Empress spoke up again. So they were fighting a civil war that whole time. No, Your Majesty. They were never a single government in the first place. They only formed that after finding out that other races existed. A damaged ship inadvertently fell out of FTL in their system. The crew was dead, so the only source of information was the ship. So they examined the ship and reverse-engineered what they found. Mixed with their technology, Gesalek added. It had long been a dream of the humans to find life outside their world, so they were ecstatic to meet other races. They explored, they traded, they shared knowledge freely. So they were caught off guard when a Takarzian fleet entered their home system and attacked them without warning. The humans suffered enormous casualties at first, but they weren't helpless, Gesalek said. They'd fought wars amongst themselves for almost their entire existence, and they were very good at it. But they were comparatively novices at deep space combat. It took them months to drive the invaders out, and the cost was high. For both sides, Gesalek paused. 
I've heard rumors that Takartzion survivors were traumatized by their later engagements with the humans, especially the ground forces. As a departing act of defiance, the Takarsian launched a missile containing a biological weapon at Earth, the human cradle world. My human friend told me it caused an ecological disaster on their planet. Vast swaths of their planet became sterile. The biological agents were less effective against humans than the Takarsian hoped. The humans had a long history of dealing with virulent and deadly diseases, which helped to protect them from the biological agents. It just made them sick, but only killed the weakest of them, Gesalek explained. Unfortunately for the Takarzian, this included large numbers of their youngest children. Gesalek continued, As my friend told it, they could forgive the initial invasion. It wasn't something they hadn't done in their internal conflict. They might have answered the ecological devastation of their world with a punitive expedition against the Takarzian, something of equivalent damage. But the Takarzian killed their children by the millions. And that enraged them. Most races only have a couple of words that refer to revenge. The humans have dozens and none of them are good, Gasalik explained. Vendetta, revenge, a reckoning, retribution, reprisals, retaliation, vengeance, eye for an eye. Vindictive and others. But the Takarzian's actions brought one of the worst types to their borders. The humans call it blood vengeance. What the Takarzians did could only be answered with their blood, and lots of it. My human friend explained that the human race contains a darkness inside their soul that they fight to suppress. When it escapes and takes over an individual, the death and destruction they cause can ruin dozens of lives. Gesalek continued, But when that darkness escapes and runs free through their entire race, it can inflict horrors beyond your imagination. He once showed me their history, and I thought I'd seen enough in my lifetime that nothing would shock me. I was wrong. The things they'd done to each other were the most horrific things I'd ever seen. And that was to each other, so imagine what would happen to an alien race. And this act brought out the very worst in them. It was like they went insane with grief, Gesalek said. They combined the things learned from captured Takarzian technology with their own. These new warships were black as night with wings to make them look like some kind of nightmarish bird. Their body armor was jet black with helmets stylized into monstrous faces, not just things from their nightmares, but from the Takarzion too. They called this part of psychological warfare. Gesalek shuddered at the thought. They attack their opponents' minds, not like a psychic or something, but by bringing your deepest fears to life. This is what traumatized the Takarzian survivors so badly. They couldn't understand the humans' ways of making wars. They'd stand up and fight when necessary. But the humans preferred to use tricks and deception and mind games. They were like spirits, always striking where the Takarzian didn't expect them to, destroying something vital or killing some Takarzian soldiers and vanishing before guards could respond. But things were different now. When their fleets came roaring out of their territories, they did not sneak but bellowed like a charging Ganarak beast. They wanted the Takarzian to know they were coming, and they left a trail of destruction anywhere they went. Military or civilian, nothing Takarzian was left. No ships, no bases, no industries, and no Takarzian. Those that didn't flee were roasted in nuclear fire or died choking on the dust flung into the air as human mass drivers lobbed asteroids at their colonies. Even abandoned facilities and colonies were obliterated, like they didn't even want a memory of the Takarzian. They didn't even bother garrisoning the worlds they took intact. They wrecked everything Takarzian and left. This tactic also made it hard for the Takarzian to determine where the humans would strike next, and left them running around to places still smoldering from the humans' attacks, but no humans were there. But there were times when the humans stayed and ambushed the Takarzian ships that arrived. Their wreckage orbited a dead world. The humans left the Tekarzian homeworld for last, and after five years of war, they were ready for the end and surrounded the planet. Gasalik finished. What happened to the Tekarzian homeworld? The Empress asked. Gasalik pointed out a window before saying, Look for yourself. We are in orbit above it. The humans renamed it after the war was over. Once the war was finished and their children were avenged, 
They stepped back from their insanity and took stock of what they had done. They had a word for it, genocide. It was something from their past that brought great hatred towards the ones to carry it out, and now their entire race was stained with that crime. So they pulled back and abandoned all but the systems they now possess. But before they withdrew, they renamed the Tecarzion homeworld Miasma and requested it be used by everyone else as a reminder, Gasalik said. No one was eager to draw the human's ire, so they agreed. A reminder of what? Of what they would do to anyone else that attacked them? One of the Kudriks he didn't know the name of asked. Gasalik thought for a moment. Well, yes, but that wasn't why they did it. The term miasma was from one of their earliest myths, a term for a type of guilt that runs so deep that it permanently stains all of their race, their blood. It affects all of them, even the ones living today. They collectively let that darkness run free, and the results were so horrific that they don't feel it can be forgiven, only atoned for. Every year they mark the fall of the Takarzion homeworld, not with celebration, but with reminders of what they did. Their avoidance of war is not to protect themselves. It's to protect others from them, Gesalik finished. He could tell that only the Empress truly got his point. The rest of them didn't seem convinced, and Grand Stractigo and Shag Kushana still thought their military was too superior to lose. Gesalik sat in his favorite chair, enjoying just being among others. It was three years ago this week that he tried to convince the Kudriks that attacking the humans was a bad idea and that killing their kids was a worse idea. And now they are losing the war badly. Of the 138 systems they started with, they have less than 21 left. But not all of those systems fell to the humans. Fifty-seven of them broke away to form their own empire and allied with the humans. They are led by a very smart empress who not only listened to my advice but took it a step further. When her foolish husband allowed Grand Stractigo and Shag Kushana to attack the humans, after the Grand Stractigo tried to intimidate the humans by glassing several civilian colonies, she sent a message to the humans. She offered a solution allowing them to get revenge but avoid making the same mistake as before. She would break away from the Empire with as many systems as possible and ally with the humans. Kudrek's civilians could flee to her new Empire for safety. Her forces could even help evacuate those who surrendered, including military personnel. Meanwhile, the humans could wreck her former husband's empire as they liked. She also told them she would be handing over any of the officers responsible for glassing the human colonies for trial. Gesalek looked forward to seeing Grand Stractigo and Shag Kushana on trial.